the London Olympic Games just ended. The whole world was watching. And in British media, there was a phrase that kept coming back again and again. This is what these Olympic Games are all about. It's just that the phrase was used for many, many different things. It was said about the theme of the Games, inspiring a generation. A boy said it about getting to know new sports that he had never heard about before, like handball, which is very popular in my home country, but he had never seen it. They said it about winning, Usain Bolt, who won, about counting the gold medals, about setting new world records. Kenya's Rhodesia led the 800 meters from start to finish and beat a new world record. An immigrant boy, Mo Farah, who came to the UK when he was 11 years old, he made his nation proud by two gold medals. Was that what the Olympic Games were all about? It was said that it was about teamwork and friendship. It was said that it was all about the spirit that the American athlete Manteo Mitchell showed when he broke his leg in the relay four times, 400 meters. But he continued to run with a broken leg because he wanted to support his three colleagues. Or was it about what Roger Bannister said, the legendary British runner who was the first to run an English mile under four minutes? He said, the games have given a sense of national pride and greater tolerance in multi-race Britain. Or was it what the Chinese talked about? For them, the games were all about a step in the direction of their ultimate goal, namely to win all the medals in order to show that the Chinese system is the best system in the world. Maybe in the end it was all down to it's never too late for exercise. Well, we could go on. This was just a selection. But what the world was watching is now over. And tonight our pastor's conference begins here in Rugashka Slatina in Slovenia. And so my question to you this evening is, what is it all about? What is God's mission all about? What is Seventh-day Adventism all about? What is it all about to be a pastor in this church? I put it to you this evening that it is all about making God know. And this central idea comes from the biblical concept of the mission of God. Driven by his love for the world, God wants to be known as God among its nations and peoples. This is the essence of the plan of salvation and the cosmic great controversy between good and evil. God wants relations with his created beings. That's why he created the world and will heal and restore it to what he intended it for. John saw it in a vision in Revelation 21 verses 1 to 5. He saw a new heaven and a new earth coming down from heaven. And then when that happens, God will live with men and they will be his people. And God himself will be with them and be their God. And therefore, he has called the church to make him known. This is what the three angels' messages are all about. To every nation, tribe, language, and people, the eternal gospel is, Revelation 14, verse 7, you know it by heart, fear God and give him glory because the hour of his judgment has come. Worship him who made the heavens, the earth, the sea and the springs of water. 
The second angel applies the eternal gospel that makes God known to God's great adversary, Babylon, who rules the nations in rejection of God. And the message is that since God is God, Babylon will fall like Babylon of old, leaving no trace because his righteous acts will have been revealed. Many people will come and worship him. They will stand up and jubilate and praise God because of the freedom from bondage that they will experience when Babylon is fallen. The third angel applies the eternal gospel that makes God known to all individuals who are caught in false worship, warning them about the consequences of not knowing God. And the message is, avoid false worship of the beast that upholds the Babylonian oppression and falsehood. In saying this, the third angel implies that the God made known by the first angel is the only true God. And besides him, there is no God. John the visionary records in his book that patient endurance is the required attitude of those who already know God. He calls them the saints who keep God's commandments and the faithfulness of Jesus. He records a heavenly voice that blesses those who are faithful to God, as Jesus was faithful to God, even to the point of dying in the Lord. And finally, John records what the Spirit says, namely that those who die in the Lord will have rest from their pains and labor, not like those who don't know God, who will have no rest. And those who have died in the Lord faithfully will be rewarded by God on the day of resurrection for their deeds will follow them. We read about this in Revelation 14 verses 12 to 13. And then when this is done, John sees one like a son of man coming, seated on a white cloud with a crown of gold on his head and a sharp sickle in his hand. And the final harvest begins in Revelation 14, verses 14 to 20. Its outcome is that those who know God will be delivered and presented before God with the Lamb, whom they follow wherever he goes, as we see in verses 1 to 5 in the same chapter. But those who reject God will be judged according to the final verses in chapter 14. Now, my dear friends, making God known in Europe is our great challenge. It's our great calling. People in Europe believe that they can handle life without God. I know, I'm a European. I've lived in Europe all my life. And they are now many years. Thanks to God. And the result of living without God is a dysfunctional life. Because you cannot live happily without being connected with your Creator. This is what the three angels' messages are all about. And by making God known in Europe, we will do two things. We will fulfill God's special calling to us as Seventh-day Adventists in our part of the world, and we will meet the needs of the people with whom we live, because they need God. Let there be no doubt about that. But we cannot make God known unless we first know him. So what does knowing God really mean? I've studied this myself. Let me share a few observations with you this evening. In the Bible, the term know, when applied to persons, is not primarily an intellectual or factual matter, as we tend to think in intellectual Europe. 
Knowing God is not primarily about the facts of God or the existence of God or even a doctrine about God. The Hebrew concept yada, know, and its function in the Hebrew Testament and Jewish tradition has greatly influenced the Greek New Testament, the whole Bible, and it is going completely against the understanding of knowledge in the Greco-Roman Hellenistic world. To know implies an intimate relationship, like the knowledge a husband has of his wife in their intimate communion. Knowing God is to encounter him, finding out what, what he is all about, finding out that he is who he says he is, and having an active, practical communion with God. It is an experience with God, an experience that makes you accept the consequences of that experience. It is knowledge that gives insight into the will of God in command and in blessing. It is acknowledgement of God and obedient and grateful submission to what you know about him. The knowledge of God in Christianity is a service to God. In 1 Thessalonians 1 verse 9 we read, you turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God. It changes your life to know God. It changes who you are. It changes what you want, what you prefer. It changes your taste. It changes what you do. To know is a reciprocal experience in the Bible. If I know you, you know me. If I know God, God knows me. And the Apostle Paul hints at this concept when he says in 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 12, Now we see but a poor reflection as in a mirror. Then we shall see face to face. And here it comes. Now I know God's love in part. Then I shall know God's love fully, even as I am fully known. Another part of knowing in the Bible is that when it describes a relationship, it is always referring to a process. Either the relationship is growing deeper, more intense and mature, or it's becoming more superficial, more slack, and less filled with commitment. Just like it is in marriage, in the relationship between a man and a woman, either you grow and go deeper and come closer and love more, or you drift apart. Knowing somebody requires work, a giving up of self, and embracing the other to become one with her or him. And it is the same thing with God. Knowing God is to live in partnership with him, him who is growing deeper, more intense and mature. And making God known is simply to share this experience with others. I invite you to that experience this evening. And I have prayed and I wish that every moment of this conference and thereafter will invite you strongly to know God so that you can share him with other people. But who then is God? The one we know and make known. Well, the biblical answer is very straight and I believe that the Bible is all about this. This is what the Bible is all about. To explain to us who God is and what he wants and how we can come to know him. The Bible says, and maybe some become pessimistic when they see it, in one text it says that God alone is immortal and lives in unapproachable light whom no one has seen or can see. But Jesus Christ 
made God known through his death and resurrection. See, for example, in Colossians chapter 2, verse 9. In Christ, all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. Or in 1 John 5, 20. We know also that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding so that we may know him who is true. And we are in him who is true, even in his Son, Jesus Christ. He is the true God and eternal life. The Bible goes on to say that knowing God in Jesus Christ means to live in his death and resurrection. Our baptism is a symbol of that. And the Apostle Paul said in Philippians chapter 3, verses 7 and following, says, But whatever was to my profit, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them rubbish, that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God and is by faith. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of sharing in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow to attain to the resurrection of the dead. My brothers and sisters, we must preach and teach Christ's death on the cross and the resurrection. If we are to be true to the word of God, all the four gospels aim at and reach their climax in telling the story about Christ's death and resurrection. The apostle Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15 verses 1 to 8 that the gospel he preached to the Corinthians and by which they are saved was something that he received and passed on to them as something of first importance. When the word of God says to us that there is something which is of first importance, what should we do with that? We should focus on that. We should put it at the, at the forefront. And this is it. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 3 to 8. Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. He was buried and he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures and he appeared to Peter and then to the twelve. And after that he appeared to more than 500 of the bro brothers at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. And last of all he appeared to me also, as to one abnormally born. And then Paul goes on to explain the resurrection of the dead, saying that if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless, and so is your faith. He repeats and says that if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. In chapter 15, verse 17, 1 Corinthians. He says, if only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are to be pitied more than all men. My friends, we have here in the Bible a revelation from God of first importance. Our faith, our preaching, God's mission as we understand it in his word, everything is based on the resurrection of Jesus Christ. But when did I hear a sermon on that topic in an Adventist church? We have even managed to lose sight of the resurrection in the three angels' messages. For it is clearly central in verse 13 in chapter 14, which we seldom refer to. The phrase, the deeds of the dead who die in the Lord will follow them, is a set phrase in contemporary Judaism 
meaning that the works of the righteous dead are being laid up with God and will be revived at the end of time when the righteous receive their reward, which is what Revelation teaches in chapters 20 and 19. Yes, we are special in God's sight. Makes us very humble, doesn't it? Yes, we are a remnant church, a prophetic church at the end of time. Yes, we understand so much of Bible truth and we are richly blessed with light from Scripture. Indeed, praise God for the church, for all the wonderful, loving and caring people God has brought together in our fellowship. For the love of God which is in us. For all this we praise God. But let's be serious. Let's not fool ourselves. Whatever we say and do, even if we take all that is stated on the 700 pages in the great controversy, you know which book I refer to. If you take all the signs of the times, they're becoming many these days. There's a hopelessness around in the world which I've seldom seen in my life. And if you take our sanctified and healthy lives, if you take all this, if we fall short on the very basis of our faith, that which is of prime importance, Christ, who has made God known in his death and resurrection, then our preaching is useless and our faith is futile. Is it because we haven't preached this gospel enough and with this right conviction that we do not see many people being gripped by the gospel and changed by it? Maybe. Who is the God that we know? Who is the God that we make known in our ministry? It is the God who revealed himself in the love of Jesus Christ. As described by the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. And who then raised Jesus Christ from the dead. You see, you know that what I say now is true. I don't need to bring proof. Death. Your and my death, the death of your loved one, the death of your parents, your friends. Death is the great tragedy of human beings, also in Europe. But nobody wants to talk about it. People die today in hospitals behind closed doors. While the world was looking at the Olympic Games, a young girl, 12 years old, Tia Sharp, was murdered and hidden in her grandmother's attic. And how many more lost their lives at the same time? And here we are tonight with the only piece of hope and good news from Jesus' resurrection that the world has ever known. But we are silent about it, are we? Should we make God known? Should we preach the gospel as it comes to us in the word of God? N.T. Wright is a New Testament scholar. In his book, Surprised by Hope, he shows that several radical changes that the first Christians brought into the world and which we find there in the New Testament they deviated from what people in those days believed about the resurrection. It was not something that people expected. And these changes, he proves, can only be explained by something crucial and unexpected that happened and that changed the lives of the first Christians. It changed them to such an extent that they were willing to die as martyrs for their faith. And this chain of martyrs who gave their life for their faith just continued and continued. And in the end, it brought the Roman Empire down on its knees. And Christianity became the dominant religion 
in the country. That's power. That's really seeing the power of the gospel and what it can do even for Europe today. All the New Testament is based on eyewitness evidence for the resurrection. The life and death of these witnesses prove to me that Christ is indeed risen. This gives me a fantastic hope as a human being. It helps me live my life now and even to face death, which I will one day. Sharing this with conviction and joy and humility and love is to make God known. As we read the Bible with new eyes, with the eyes of the Bible itself, only then can we share the genuine, original Christian life and faith in Christ as the resurrected Lord who is now connecting us with God and soon to return. Only then can we understand what the Christian hope really means and what our hope is. Only then can we experience our own death and resurrection in our baptism to a new life in service to God who raised Christ. Only then, friends, there is hope for change, salvation, transformation, revival and reformation, you name it, whatever word you want to use. There are new possibilities in our world because of Jesus Christ. Without him, there is nothing. Because it leads us face to face with the God who created the world, who has never given up his care for us, despite all evil, whose mission is to create all things new in order for us to live in an open fellowship with him, and who therefore taught us to pray, thy kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. He, this God, my God and your God, and none other than he has given us the assurance that we rest in his arms when our life is ended, and that he, and none other than he, has provided an escape from death, the resurrection from death, in following Jesus and being faithful to God like Jesus was. He raised Jesus up. He raised us up. He raised me up. Let us make this God known. No.
Oh. Mm-hmm.